Hi, my name is Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for tuning back into The Abyss. Go ahead and subscribe to us. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Abyss Pod. You can also like us on Facebook, so that way you can see whenever we have new episodes come out. And if you want, you can join us on our Facebook group, The Abyss Group, where we talk about cases. You can give your input. We'll respond. And we even give updates on cases if we see any. And make sure to stay tuned after every episode. We have bloopers at the end. So if you want to lighten the mood a little bit, not end on such a sad or scary or intense note, then you can always tune into the bloopers. Today we're discussing a case in which an everyday household item that's meant to relieve pain becomes the source of it. This is the case of the Chicago Tylenol murders. So let's jump into the abyss. Mary Kellerman was a normal 12-year-old girl. She was a 7th grader that lived with her parents in Elk Grove Village, Illinois. And on the morning of September 29th in 1982, she woke up not feeling well. She had a sore throat, runny nose. So she went to her father and told him that she wasn't feeling well. And he pulled out some Tylenol, gave her a capsule, and sent her back to bed. Told her she didn't have to go to school that day, that she was fine to just stay home and rest. So she went back to bed, and then a little while later, he heard her get up and go to the bathroom, and then he heard a loud thump. And he wasn't too concerned at first. He thought maybe she had just knocked something over or tripped, but then he didn't hear any other noise. So he went to the bathroom, to the door, knocked on the door, and asked if she was okay, heard no response, and finally he opened the door and found her collapsed on the floor. So after he found her on the floor, he called 911 and paramedics rushed over to try to help her. But unfortunately, she was pronounced dead at 9.56 a.m. And at this point, there was really no suspicion about foul play or anything. But because it was an unexplained death of a child, it was very sudden and unexpected. So they ordered an autopsy just to see what might have gone on to cause her death. On the same day, a man named Adam Janice, who was 27 years old, living in Arlington Heights, Illinois, he was a postal worker, and he felt a cold coming on. We also saw some notes of him having chest pains or neck pains, but all we know is that he wasn't really feeling very well that morning. He went and he picked up his two kids from school, and he picked up some Tylenol, and he took two capsules and laid down around noon to try and get some rest, see if he could feel a little bit better. Minutes later, he staggered into the kitchen and fell, and he was rushed to the ICU, but he could not be resuscitated. Dr. Thomas Kim, who worked in the ER, said, quote, I was talking to his family, explaining, trying to explain what had happened. It's hard even if you know the diagnosis. I was trying to tell them we didn't know why, end quote. He was declared dead on September 29th, and at first this death was thought to just be a heart attack. So Adam's whole family was gathered at the hospital, and once he passed away, they were obviously all very distraught, and they decided to go back to his house to be with his wife, to be together with family, and just sort of commiserate this loss that they had just had. Once they were back at Adam's house, his brother Stanley and Stanley's wife Teresa complained of headaches. They said they weren't feeling great, which is a pretty common response to something that stressful so Stanley went and got some Tylenol and took a couple of capsules and then Teresa called her parents to let them know what was happening to explain everything and then five to ten minutes later she took two capsules as well not long after that Stanley started feeling uneasy he was disoriented and finally he collapsed and the paramedics were called back to this house for the second time that day And while the paramedics were working on Stanley, Teresa collapsed as well. Charles Kramer of the Arlington Heights Fire Department said, quote, When I arrived at the house, there were cars and people everywhere. All eight of my men were working, four on one man and four on a woman. Everything that would happen to the man happened to the woman a few minutes later. Back at the hospital, 
Dr. Thomas Kim was about to leave for the day. He was hanging up his jacket and ready to head out when a nurse came in and told him that the Janice family was back at the hospital. And initially he thought that it was Adam's parents. They were kind of frail and had some health issues. So he thought maybe the stress and the shock may have triggered some kind of health problem. But then he was told, no, it was actually his brother and that his brother's wife was there as well. So at this point, they knew something was going on. Three members of the same family had come in with similar symptoms. Stanley was declared dead at 8.15 p.m. on the night of the 29th, but Teresa was kept on life support for another couple of days and wouldn't die until 1.15 p.m. on October 1st. These losses were obviously really hard for the Janus family. Three seemingly healthy young people died within a really short period of time in this really unexplained way. Unfortunately, it took a pretty big toll on the family. Joseph, who was Stanley and Adam's brother, went into a really deep depression. It was also really hard on their sister, Sophia. Teresa's brother, Robert, actually had to come home from Marine boot camp when she became sick. So it impacted this family really deeply. This is when the doctors started realizing that there must be some environmental factor affecting these people. They were dying in the same ways. They had the same symptoms. Something just seemed a little bit off. Dr. Thomas Kim called Poison Control and gave them a list of all of the symptoms he had been seeing. John B. Sullivan of the Rocky Mountain Poison Control thought that it sounded a lot like cyanide poisoning. So they took blood samples and they sent them off for testing. So a toxicologist was called out to assess the whole situation and help them out. And Dr. Kim said, quote, I was pacing in my office. I kept going in my systematic way. What it is likely or not likely, all I came down to was cyanide. But I said, no, where? Where was the exposure? The only way I could test was to check the blood for cyanide. I had never done that. I'd never heard of it. We didn't do it in the hospital. Someone, maybe another doctor, told me about a lab that does those special tests. So I sent blood samples away. Because remember, this was the 80s. This was before labs were so prevalent and the testing was really common. Yeah, they were really limited on their resources that they had available. Adam's wife had told the police that they had all eaten peaches that day, all drank some coffee, and had all taken Tylenol. So the local firefighters ended up discussing the deaths in the area. And one of them, Richard Keyworth, mentioned about Kellerman and how she had taken Tylenol right before she died. They called the paramedics that had been involved with the case and asked about if there was any Tylenol involved. And they were told that the three of them had ingested Tylenol before the incident. So they immediately contacted the police to let them know what they had just found out. The investigators still weren't convinced of the Tylenol connection. So they went to the home to investigate and see what they could find there. Adam was involved in some metalwork as a hobby. Police thought maybe this caused the exposure to cyanide because some polishing agents contain cyanide, but they couldn't find any of the specific kind. So that was kind of ruled out. Nurse Jensen went into the bathroom and found Tylenol in a cabinet. She opened the bottle and found that six capsules were missing. And that's when she immediately thought this is the cause. This is what the connection is between these three people. She said, quote, I said right then and there, it's the Tylenol. I said, this is the cause, and of course nobody would believe me, and I stamped my feet. They said, oh no, it couldn't be, it couldn't be. They didn't think a nurse, a woman, could make the connection. So while investigators were searching the Janus home, authorities went to the Kellerman home to collect evidence from there. They collected the Tylenol bottle. Deputy Medical Examiner Donahue told Investigator Pichos, that he needed to open these bottles and smell them. And when he opened the bottle, he smelled bitter almonds. Donahue said it was actually really lucky that Pichos could smell it at all because about 20 to 40% of the population cannot smell cyanide. So it's sort of like how 10% of the population thinks cilantro tastes like soap, like me. I highly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a good chance that he would have not been able to smell it. But luckily enough, he did, and it kind of set the ball rolling on the cyanide thing being confirmed. The Cook County toxicologist Michael Schaefer examined the Tylenol and found certain capsules were filled with 65 milligrams of cyanide, which is about 10,000 times the lethal dose. Specifically, it was found to be potassium cyanide, which is used in silver mining, fertilizer, steel processing, photo development, and chemical manufacturing, so lots of uses out there for it. 
investigators thought the capsules must have been filled and replaced on the shelf pretty quickly because cyanide actually degrades the outer part of the capsule. So if it was left there for too long, it would have degraded to the point that people probably wouldn't have taken it at all. Cyanide poisoning can occur from either inhalation or ingestion. And some of the symptoms include weakness, confusion, headaches, nausea, difficulty breathing, loss of consciousness, cardiac arrest, convulsions, respiratory failure, and it'll feel like you're suffocating even though you're breathing and there's plenty of air. So, and the reason that people feel like they're suffocating even though they're able to breathe is because their cells are being prevented from using oxygen. Around 10 a.m. on September 30th, a representative from Johnson & Johnson came to collect the information about what had been going on with the deaths and the cyanide inside of the capsules. Roy Dames of the Cook County Medical Examiner Office said, quote, My first reaction was, let's make sure there's no other connection between these deaths before we go and tell people not to take Tylenol. So they proved it to me, and I said, great, let's go. I believe I talked to the CEO of the company that made Tylenol, and I informed him that we were going to have a press conference, and his reaction was, do you have to? And I said, well, do you have a better idea? And he said, no, end quote. At 10 a.m., Deputy Medical Examiner Donahue held a press conference that told people that cyanide had been found inside of some Tylenol and that people shouldn't take it for a while. At 3 p.m. on the same day, Johnson & Johnson announced a recall of Tylenol from the lot that had the laced bottles of Tylenol. After the press conference where they came out with all of the cyanide poisoning from the Tylenol and how not to take it, Nurse Jensen's husband woke her up and told her that she had been right about everything and that it was the Tylenol. Unfortunately, this press conference and the recall came a little bit too late for the four other victims. The first was Paula Prince. She was a 35-year-old flight attendant for United, and she had just landed in O'Hare Airport after a flight from Las Vegas. She wasn't feeling super great, so she stopped at a drugstore and picked up some Tylenol. And when she got home, she took a couple capsules and laid down. A couple days later, she was supposed to meet her sister for dinner, and she didn't show. She didn't answer her phone, never returned any phone calls, and then she also missed a scheduled flight at work. So people started getting concerned. They called a wellness check, and the police went to check on her. Around 5 p.m. on October 1st, she was found dead in her apartment. There was a Tylenol bottle still open on the counter, And it was determined that she had been dead by the time that the press conference had taken place. So it was too late to help her. So again, the toxicologist was called out and Paula's blood samples were sent off for testing. During the investigation, police wanted to go back and see, you know, where exactly these bottles came from. So police traced back where she had bought this Tylenol from, went to the store and found CCTV footage of her buying it. We have a still frame from this footage on our website, so you can go check that out. And in the top right corner, there's an arrow pointing to an individual. And we'll talk more about that later, but it's believed that that might be an image of the murderer. A friend and fellow flight attendant, Joan Ahern, said, quote, Paula was blonde, vivacious, and had a gorgeous smile. That guy stole all her dreams, her life, her future. He just destroyed it all. Just poof, one pill. What makes a man do something like that? Another woman also missed the memo about this Tylenol laced with cyanide. She was 27 years old. She lived in Winfield, Illinois. She was a brand new mother, and she had already had three kids prior, so she was now a mother of four. Mary had just gotten out of the hospital the previous day from giving birth, and she had some post-labor pains and decided to take some Tylenol to put that at ease around 3.45 p.m. on September 29th. Unfortunately, she was pronounced dead at 9.30 a.m. on September 30th. Ed, her husband, said, quote, We were together for a long time. She was an excellent mother. She had four children. The baby was a week old. I came home right after she had fallen on the floor. An ambulance came. I'm not going to say a whole lot more than that, end quote. That's pretty distressing to think that you're going to come home. You have your four kids. You just had another baby. You know, like that's supposed to be a really happy time, really positive time. And you walked into your wife dead from cyanide poisoning just because some person thought it was a good idea to 
lace a whole bunch of different Tylenol packages. Yeah, it's really, really sad. A lot of lives cut short. The final victim known was Mary McFarland. She was 31, living in Elmhurst, Illinois, and she had been complaining of a headache to her co-workers around 6.30 p.m. on September 29th, and she was found dead at 3.15 a.m. on September 30th. And that leaves us with our seventh known victim from the Tylenol murders, but there could have been other people considering that at the beginning they thought it was a heart attack or it was an unknown cause of death. So if it wasn't obvious that that person had taken Tylenol, there could have been a lot of other people who passed away from cyanide poisoning through Tylenol. After this, the hospital started getting panicked calls from people after they had taken Tylenol. A lot of people were really scared, but hospitals pretty much said if you can call us then you're fine if you have lived long enough or you know are coherent enough to make this call you're going to be okay just don't take any more Tylenol yeah chuck the rest (laughs) on October 4th Chicago City Council passed ordinances to require all drugs sold in stores have tamper resistant packaging so within a short time they were really cracking down on this and trying to protect people trying to prevent this from happening further or to other products The next day, on October 5th, Johnson & Johnson issued a recall of all Tylenol products. It was about 31 million bottles of Tylenol. Every bottle was pulled off the shelf. People were asked to turn in bottles that they had or at least get rid of them, don't take any more. So most people just threw them away, but a lot of people turned them in. So the turned in bottles were tested and a total of eight bottles were found containing cyanide. The bottles were found at six different retailers, two separate Jewel Foods, an Osco drug, a Walgreens, Frank's Finer Foods, and a Dominic's. Each of these stores had one laced bottle with about three to ten lace capsules inside, but Osco actually had two laced bottles. Like I said, a lot of people got rid of their bottles, about 60% of users just threw them away, so there could have been a lot more bottles out there and they were just disposed of. We'll never know at this point, but at least eight bottles were actually found to contain cyanide. This was taken really seriously. There was a so-called Tylenol task force that was about 115 people working on it until the end of October when that task force was kind of reduced. Once they have sort of sifted through all the evidence that they could find, it was reduced from 115 to about 40 people. But those people were still working on it really hard and trying to track down any connection, any lead in the case. So these Tylenol murders were considered an act of terrorism, and it pushed a lot of people to make changes. Some health departments ended up banning Tylenol completely just to avoid this type of scenario from happening. The crisis management of Tylenol is considered to be the best corporate response, and it's taught in business schools up to this day showing how to handle these types of situations. Many people thought that Tylenol would be sunk by this. They thought that they wouldn't be able to come back from this poisoning. But James Burke, the CEO, made immediate and honest statements about the entire situation, and they investigated all the manufacturers, and they were able to prove that tampering had happened in the stores rather than happening at the facility that it was manufactured in. Once they had found out about the cyanide poisonings, they ended up, they started taking certain steps. And on day one, they set up a toll-free number for people to call in. They sent hundreds of thousands of messages to the hospitals and retailers about retailers about what had happened, and they stopped advertisements completely. Within one week, they had recalled 31 million bottles of capsules against the judgment of the FDA and FBI officials. They worked with the police to catch the culprit, and they did this very openly. They wanted to find the person who was responsible for this, and they wanted someone to be punished for killing all of these people, messing up their business. All all of this stuff was just bad for them. Yeah, and like you said, this was really shown as how you're supposed to handle it, how a company should handle it, and a lot of other companies kind of falter in these situations because they either wait too long to respond or they try to cover up certain information and they let greed get the best of them rather than the safety of the consumers but johnson and johnson was widely regarded as being very very honest very blunt and brutal with the truth like this is what's happening and this is how we're going to handle it instead of kind of sidestepping or sweeping it under the rug they really faced it head on 
Yeah, not only were they being honest with the public, but they were actively taking part in trying to solve the problem. And within months, they redistributed Tylenol with packaging that had three safeguards, and it was introduced on November 11th, 1982. They gave coupons that made it a bit cheaper, and they also manufactured tablets, which were much less susceptible to tampering in general. So they were really trying to prevent this from happening again and to catch the person who was responsible for it. So Tylenol ended up making that full recovery in the markets and they gained back the trust of their consumers. And as we know today, we all use Tylenol all the time. People use it for pain medications. It's one of the most common ones. Police decided that someone must have taken the Tylenol off the shelves and filled the capsules with cyanide and then later returned with the bottles. They found that two of the lace bottles had came from the same batch, but the other bottles came from all over the country. So manufacturing level of tampering was very unlikely. The stores found with contaminated bottles suggested that the murderer drove a very specific route. And it ended up kind of being in the shape of a circle. And we have that map on our website that you can look and see kind of the path he took to contaminate all of these bottles. The police decided to make a profile because at this point they knew that there was foul play. They knew someone was tampering with it. They called in John Douglas. He was at the beginning of his career, but he's now considered a pretty famous profiler. He suspected that the person was a loner, probably motivated by anger at society. And there was a possibility that he had previous psychiatric treatment to deal with extreme anger or depression. He might have openly complained about society and how he felt personally slighted by society in general and that he would have tried to contact people in power about how angry he was and how he felt rejected when they didn't respond. It was likely that he lived in Chicago and he had a car because he had a lot of knowledge of the area and he was able to move around as he pleased. He also said that the suspect would most likely work in a job that involved cyanide, so he had easy access to it, such as working with metals or mining, like we had mentioned before. He probably also had a low-paying job and had a hard time keeping that job in general, maybe jumped from different jobs a lot or wasn't one of the best employees. And even though this profile that John Douglas created seems very in-depth and long, it's very vague to a lot of people, and they couldn't really narrow down like who this could be. So Chicago native with a car and lonely and a low-paying job. Yeah, that describes a lot of people. But this was pretty much all they had to work with. They didn't have much information other than the bottles themselves and these victims, so they just kind of had to run with what they had. And this leads us to sort of the list of suspects that they went through during this investigation. So this first one's not necessarily considered a suspect at this point, but she was a person of interest. On October 27th, 1982, a woman turned in a Tylenol bottle that she said she had bought one to two weeks prior at a Frank's in Winfield. She said she was a judge's wife and left the bottle with them and then left. This bottle was actually found to contain laced pills. So obviously they wanted to talk to her again and figure out a little bit more information. But when they went to find this woman they went to the judge who she said she was married to and his wife was not this woman they realized that she had lied about her identity so they had no idea who she was they didn't know why she had lied or what her connection to the case was it was really suspicious like as you mentioned earlier that this just happened to be a laced bottle and she was really a fishy person yeah they also tracked this bottle back and said that it actually had come from a franks in wheaton instead of winfield which You know, they're both kind of W. Maybe she had just gotten it mixed up or maybe she was deliberately trying to lie about when and where she had bought it. This one kind of stumps me, too, because you think if she did have some part in it, why is she handing in the bottle? I mean, sometimes people that perpetrate crimes want to be involved. They want more information, so they kind of insert themselves in. So I can kind of see that where... You know, sometimes they just want more attention than they're getting. And even though the crime was very notorious and well-known in that area, maybe she just wanted more information or maybe she was just attention-seeking in a different way or maybe it was just an innocent thing and she just didn't want people to know who she was. There's so many ways that could go. The only description they really have of her was she was between 40 and 50 years old and it's pretty vague and they never actually ended up finding her that I could find. Another suspect that they looked at was Unabomber Ted Kaczynski. 
it was a reach for investigators, but they knew that Kaczynski's bombings and the Chicago Tunnel murders were acts of terrorism. Ted was from Chicago, and he had initially targeted people around Chicago as well. Also, his parents lived really close to the area where the pills were being laced. So there were a lot of these little connections that some of the police were seeing. There was also a death that was not directly linked to the Chicago Tylenol murders, but it happened in Sheridan, Wyoming. J. Adam Mitchell had been poisoned with cyanide in Tylenol. Where he lived was on the way to Ted's cabin in the woods. When he kind of decided to break away from society, go live on his own, he was very paranoid about modern technology taking over the world. So to this day, Ted still claims his innocence. The FBI started auctioning off some of Ted's belongings, and they also asked for his DNA. But Ted declined saying that he would only give up his DNA if they stopped auctioning off his belongings. The federal auction wasn't ended, even though Ted, you know, had threatened to not give up his DNA if they continued it. They still continued it, and Ted's DNA was not given up. Some more theories came out on why they possibly were considering Ted as a suspect. And online, there's some timelines that are connecting Ted and the murders. But we haven't researched in depth from those timelines, so we don't know if that's all substantiated appropriately. But that is one reasoning behind why some people believe that Ted was responsible. Also, the word would It's kind of a stretch a little bit, but supposedly Ted was obsessed with anything wood-related. He included it in his bombs. Several of his victims had wood in their names or they had a wood association in their names. This coincides with the Chicago Tylenol murders because Johnson & Johnson was founded by two men named Robert Wood Johnson and James Wood Johnson. Also, the laced pills came from places like Woodfield, and Elk Grove, so it kind of connects back to the wood aspect. Furthermore, people believed that Ted was the man in the picture with Paula on the CCTV from the drugstore, making him possibly the murderer behind the Tylenol murders. The next suspect was 48-year-old Roger Arnold, and he was a dock hand that worked at a warehouse that distributed Tylenol to two of the stores that had contained laced bottles. One of the stores where lace pills were found was also right across the street from a mental hospital where his wife was. He actually had an assault charge that he had a warrant out for, so police brought him in and questioned him in regards to the Chicago Tylenol murders as well. It was alleged that he had bragged about killing people with cyanide previously. He admitted to using cyanide in past projects. He was a closet chemist. He had lots of powders and beakers, different chemicals at his home. Police also found weapons, a one-way plane ticket to Thailand, and a book that described how to kill people by putting poison in pills. So he looked pretty good for it. I don't know why people can write a book on how to put poison in pills and it get published, but that's just my perspective. (laughs) Yeah, there's all kinds of weird things out there. None of the chemicals that were found at his home were found to be potassium cyanide. So they couldn't really connect him to the Chicago Tylenol murders, but they charged him with weapons violation and he was sent to jail and later he was released on bond. But that's not where the story ends because apparently while he was sitting in jail, he was plotting his revenge against the person he thought had turned him into the police in regards to the Tylenol murders. He thought someone had ratted him out or was, you know, spreading lies about him. Once he was released on bond, he actually ended up shooting a man named John Stanisha, who was coming out of a bar. And unfortunately, Stanisha had no connection to Arnold at all. He just so happened to look like a man named Martin Sinclair, who was the man that Arnold thought had turned him in, ratted him out. So after that, Arnold was sentenced to 30 years in prison, but he was paroled after about 15 and he died in 2008. Another suspect that they looked into was a woman named Lori Dan. She had grown up in Chicago and met a man named Russell. They married in 1982, and he worked as an insurance broker. Things in their marriage went bad very quickly. Lori was controlling and demanding, and she displayed a lot of strange behavior in their marriage. In 1986, Lori called an ex-boyfriend and told him that she was having his child and that she needed money for child care and whatnot, but he refused to believe her, and after this conversation, she accused him of rape. 
she was very out there. She was willing to lie. She seemed very conning, very manipulative and controlling. And the next month, Russell, her husband, was attacked and stabbed with an ice pick. But Lori wasn't charged because he didn't see his attacker. And the police even thought that he could have self-inflicted this wound, which I think is just insane. (laughs) Not to mention, Lori started harassing Russell's family. So things got really crazy in their marriage. Eventually, Lori and Russell got divorced. And in 1987, Lori accused Russell of rape. She was dead set on it that he had raped her and she passed two polygraphs but there was no evidence that it actually occurred she was also working as a babysitter in the same year and she was stealing clothes and food and damaging the property of the people's homes she was also observed riding elevators for hours on end and she would leave rotting meat on her sofa she just had a lot of strange behavior that she was partaking in Lori also purchased another gun and was being treated for various mental illnesses. She refused any of the recommended treatments and she just tried to continue on with her life, but she clearly had a bunch of stuff going on. In 1988, she started getting a little bit more out of hand. She was stealing books from the library on poisons and she even tried to lace some snacks and drinks with arsenic. But luckily, no one was injured in the process. But if anyone made her mad, she would send them laced food or laced drinks, trying to kill them. On May 20th, 1988, she kidnapped two children that she had been babysitting. She took them with her to an elementary school where she was trying to detonate a firebomb. But the fire was quickly put out, thankfully, and no one was injured. She then drove to a daycare and tried to take in gasoline, but was stopped. And she tried to poison the boys she had kidnapped with arsenic, but they said it was gross and they had spat it out. Unlike cyanide, you can taste arsenic and it's not very pleasant. She then took the two boys that she had kidnapped and just tried to poison home. And their mother was there. She lured them all into the basement and started a fire and trapped them to try and kill them. But they ended up escaping, thankfully. Lori then went to an elementary school and she went into a room with a gun and she put all the kids in one corner of the room and just started shooting and she killed one kid, injured several others, and then tried to make a run for it through the woods. She ran into someone's home and was telling them that she had been raped and was running from him, asked for their help, and she clearly had a gun. She was waving it around, very frantic and all over the place. They tried to get the gun from her, but so she shot the father, but he ended up escaping and she tried to hold the rest of the family hostage, but when the police started closing in, she ended up shooting herself in the head to prevent her from getting arrested and serving the consequences for all of the damage she had done. She was briefly considered a suspect. I think it's kind of far-fetched. We sort of talked about this um she definitely went off the rails a little bit yeah and that's why it feels like to me the chicago tylenol murders were more calculated and it was an efficient you know very methodical way to kill people and her mo was more like crazy like run over here and do this and then run over here and do that and like very sporadic yeah very sporadic very much like she didn't have a plan she was just sort of going with whatever so that's a little off for me I mean people can like we talked about people can sort of devolve and mental illness can get worse and things but it seems like she's always kind of been that erratic off the wall sort of person and the other thing we talked about was with the books if she had previously you know successfully poisoned people with cyanide why would she later steal a bunch of books about poisoning people and different kinds of poison and why would she use arsenic if she had access to cyanide which cyanide was more effective in the tylenol murders so why would she switch it to an arsenic that wasn't working it wasn't effective it was very obvious that there was arsenic there and especially to you know kids and they're not going to eat something that's disgusting so it just doesn't really line up to me but at the same time you never really know so It could be. I don't think it is. I don't know how you feel. No, I agree. I think that the next suspect seems a lot more reasonable. So, yeah, that brings us to James Lewis, which this is a wild ride, so (laughs) strap in. (laughs) Lewis was born in Memphis, Tennessee in 1946. 
He was the son of poor migrant workers. His dad skipped out on them when he was really young. And before the age of three, his mom actually abandoned him and his two sisters, who were ages seven and nine, at a motel. She just left and never came back with these little kids just sitting there waiting. Social workers eventually found the kids and they were all split up into different homes. At age three, James was adopted out and his adoptive mother worked in a factory. His adoptive father was a sharecropper. So he was the one that was home most of the time caring for the kids. Unfortunately, his adoptive father died when he was 12 years old. And after that, his mother was destitute. They lived without plumbing, without electricity. He went hungry a lot of the time. And after a while, she remarried to a groundskeeper of a golf course. So they kind of had a more elevated status now. James was bullied in school, but he made good grades. He was in the marching band. He was on the yearbook committee. So seemingly a well-adjusted kid. But at home, it was a different story. He was violent. He had outbursts. He had behavioral problems. His cousin, Lucille, said, quote, he was in a lot of trouble, a very mixed up boy. He always did things that ordinary people wouldn't. My aunt tried to give him back to Big Brothers because she couldn't handle him, but they wouldn't take him back. So that's pretty sad that she tried to give him back to the adoption agency because she couldn't handle it. That's a really sad position for a kid to be in. James' behavior only escalated as he got older. He allegedly chased his mother around with an axe and assaulted his stepfather. His mother was so scared that she actually slept with a gun under her pillow because she thought that he might try to pull something during the night. In 1966, James overdosed on anison tablets and he was committed to a a mental hospital. There he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Later, he described his own behavior the overdose and chasing his mother and all his erratic behavior as just a draft dodging tactic. He didn't want to go to war, so he made up all this behavior so they would think that he was too mentally ill to go, and it ended up working. Decided to just put on a show. Yeah. Later, he attended the University of Missouri, where he met a woman named Leanne, and they married in 1968. They were described as two social misfits coming together that sort of didn't fit anywhere else but together so it would be sort of a sweet love story (laughs) if it wasn't so chaotic yeah in 1969 they had a daughter named tony ann and she was born with down syndrome she had heart problems wasn't in good health leanne and james both worked as bookkeepers and sometime in the 1970s james served two years of a 10-year sentence for tax fraud relating to their bookkeeping after serving his time He met a man named Raymond West who lived in his neighborhood and West would turn out to be a really good family friend to them. In 1974, unfortunately, Tony Ann passed away due to complications of a heart surgery and West was really there for the family during that time and really comforted them and he was a good friend to them. On July 23rd, 1978, West was talking to a friend, Charles Banker on the phone and he reported feeling kind of sick but he was mostly just talking about home repairs and things like that so it was just sort of a mundane conversation and they hung up later charles banker became concerned because he hadn't heard from west they normally talked very often and he hadn't heard from him for an extended period of time so he went over to west's house and saw that the doors were locked the windows were covered the car was in the garage everything seemed pretty normal Banker called the Lewises, who he knew had been close friends to West, and they said, oh, it was fine. He was in the Ozarks visiting his girlfriend, and this made Banker super suspicious because he had never known West to have any romantic relationships whatsoever, and he knew that he wouldn't just leave on a trip without telling anybody. Banker went back to the West home again, and this time there was a note on the door And the note said that Ray was going to be out of town until Thursday and for any further information to call Jim, who was James Lewis. Banker noticed that inside of the house, a shade that he had seen up the previous time that he was there was now down. So he knew someone had been inside of the house. And at this point, he called the police, had them come over. He wanted them to do a wellness check and see what was going on. They went inside the home. Everything seemed pretty much in order. They found a note on the 
coffee table that said, please do not disturb until 1 p.m. sleeping late. And this note was signed Raymond, which Banker thought was weird because he never signed things with Raymond. He always went by Ray. So that was just added suspicion. At this point, Banker decided to put new locks on the door and had a locksmith come out to change the lock. During this time, Lewis pulled up and questioned him. He was like, what are you doing? And Lewis was like, I'm putting new locks on the door to make sure that nobody else can get in because something weird is happening here. Lewis seemed kind of distraught at first, but then he sort of calmed down and just drove off. But he didn't drive away completely. Lewis actually saw him park a little bit down the street behind a truck and just sit there and watch. So that's kind of an odd behavior. Yeah, you can tell that Banker at this point was really suspicious of Lewis. Banker entered the home again on August 14th, and it smelled horrible. He searched around everywhere. He went into a guest bedroom, and there were some pillows on the floor. A blanket was kind of messed up, but it had been like that previously, so he hadn't really thought much of it. But he sort of moved things around, moved the pillows around, and he saw a bunch of dried blood. So at this point, he called the police again, and they came back out. They searched the basement, and there they found a bloody lawn chair. They found West glasses and a toupee, and it was all wrapped up in a bloody sheet. So they knew at that point something pretty bad had probably gone down. While they were searching the upstairs, they saw on the ceiling a big stain forming. And I can only imagine, you know, the sinking feeling you would sort of have seeing a stain like that. So they all went up into the attic and they found West's body lying face down. He was still in his pajamas and his legs had been cut off at the hip and were placed up around his head. His head was wrapped in a sheet and tied with a cord and there was a weird rope and pulley system that they thought had been used to hoist him up into the rafters. Oh, that's That's weird. It's like hiding his body up in the rafters of the attic. Yeah. It's like... Someone had to go through a lot of effort to make the pulley system, to dismember the body, make everything hidden. I just, it's a lot of effort for something. The decomposition was so bad that they couldn't even identify him until they matched his hair. And because of the decomposition too, they couldn't figure out exact cause of death. Not to mention his legs have been cut off, so like... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so you know that there was someone else involved there, but there was a lot of tampering. Yeah. Suspiciously enough, the police also found checks for $5,000 drawn from the West account payable to Lewis. Now, Lewis said he didn't have checks, he didn't have a key to the house, he didn't have any of West's possessions, but Lewis was arrested anyway. You know, he had been really suspicious up to this point, so I think it was just... Even still, he denied any involvement, but when his things were searched, they found rope, financial papers of Wes, they found trash bags, and they found the checks that Lewis had said were not in his possession. Lewis and his lawyer had kind of a weird claim. They claimed that West had died of natural causes and that Lewis may or may not have dismembered him, but definitely didn't kill him. Which being in that situation and seeing your friend dead and then thinking you were just, you know, going to dismember him, that in general is just awful. Why would you not report that to the police? Wouldn't you be more distraught that your friend is dead? There's just so much wrong with the fact that even if he didn't kill him, he may or may not have dismembered him. That just seems very fishy and... Yeah, you have to be pretty sick to do something like that. Yes. They thought maybe he was doing this because he had been getting money from... West for you know maybe it was social security or some kind of retirement or something like that and that this money was coming in and as long as no one knew that West was dead they could still collect this money so maybe they were trying to get rid of him so no one would ever know that he was dead and they could just collect it forever maybe it was just a bad plan to begin with it still just seems way too gruesome to even think about as a plan involving you know someone you called a close friend On November 16th, 1982, the FBI released a memo that stated that Lewis's fingerprints were found on the pulley system. He was then charged with capital murder, but the charge was later dismissed after the judge decided that the evidence had been seized unjustly. Lewis then went back to accounting. He launched a business with his wife, and this business dealt with importing 
pill making machines manufactured in India. This business eventually failed and they were accused of swindling their clients. More shady business. The police found evidence against the Lewises, but by the time they caught up to them, they had skipped town and they started living under assumed names. It was at this time that Lewis started writing letters to the police and other organizations, news sites. He claimed that he wanted the West case reopened, that he was innocent, that the police were concealing information and mishandling the case overall, but he could never really prove these claims. So this brings us back to the Tylenol murders. So around the time of the Chicago Tylenol murders, James Lewis wrote an extortion letter to Johnson & Johnson claiming credit for tampering with the Tylenol bottles and demanding a million dollars to stop. This happened on October 6th, and the letter he wrote said, quote, Gentlemen, as you can see, it is easy to place cyanide, both potassium and sodium, into capsules sitting on store shelves, and since the cyanide is inside the gelatin, it is easy to get buyers to swallow the bitter pill. Another beauty is that cyanide operates quickly. It takes so very little, and there will be no time to take countermeasures. If you don't mind the publicity of these little capsules, then do nothing. So far, I have spent less than $50, and it takes me less than 10 minutes per bottle. If you want to stop the killing, then wire $1 million to bank account 8449597 at Continental Illinois Bank, Chicago. Do not attempt to involve the FBI or local Chicago authorities with this letter. A couple of phone calls by me will undo anything you can possibly do. End quote. When the police looked at this Continental Bank account, it had been closed and was linked to a man named Frederick McKehey. He was the last surviving member of the Miller Beer family. At this time, McKehey owned a travel agency that Leanne, James Lewis's wife, was working at, and it was failing at the time. Leanne ended up leaving the travel agency and she took a bunch of postmarked envelopes, which is going to be important for later. And Leanne's last check bounced for just over $500 and Lewis launched a vendetta against McKehey. Lewis suspected McKehey was embezzling and he was trying to frame or at least inconvenience McKehey, but he never got the money back. The FBI ended up reaching out to Frederick McKehey and talking to him about Lewis's accusations, and he denied everything. And the FBI asked him if there was any enemies that he had that may want to do this to him, and he mentioned Bob and Nancy Richardson, which at the time were aliases for James and Leanne Lewis. James Lewis also sent a letter to the Chicago Tribune under the alias Robert Richardson, stating that he and his wife were innocent. The police then found out that it was James Lewis who wrote the extortion letter to Johnson & Johnson on October 6th, and they launched a multi-state search for him and his wife, Leanne. On November 11th, the police got a tip from a librarian at the New York Public Library that Lewis had been seen in there, and she recognized him from his wanted posters. After a 10-week manhunt, they finally caught James Lewis and apprehended him from the reading room in the library on December 13th. 13th, 1982. So it took them a month to actually apprehend James Lewis after realizing that he was the one who wrote the extortion letter. It also came out that there was another letter sent to the White House threatening more Tylenol murders if Reagan didn't change his policies. James Lewis denied the involvement with the murders and writing any of the letters. However, his handwriting matched with the letter and his fingerprints were found on the letter itself. So it was kind of hard to deny that he had any part in that. Police found out that Lewis and his wife were living in a hotel in New York when the tampering had occurred with the Tylenol. And he would pick her up every day and they used this as their alibi saying that they couldn't have done this and there was no travel tickets linking them to Chicago and that there was no way for them to be the murderers. However, James Lewis still raised a lot of suspicion for the police. He ended up giving authorities a detailed drawing on how to inject capsules with cyanide which seems a little peculiar, but he said he was just trying to be a good citizen and that he's not guilty. He was trying to help out the police and show them how it could have happened. But I still think it's a little fishy. Yeah, that's definitely not something that your average good citizen would do, I don't think. On October 28th, 1983, after three hours of deliberation, the jurors found Lewis guilty of extortion for the Tylenol letter that was sent to Johnson & Johnson. He was also charged with six unrelated counts of mail and credit card fraud and sentenced to 20 years for extortion 
but he only served 13 as he was released in 1995 on parole. So after his release from prison, the Lewises moved to Massachusetts. And then in 2009, their house was raided by the FBI and they removed a bunch of evidence from the home trying to find more connections to the Chicago Tylenol murders. In 2010, Lewis and his wife were ordered to provide DNA samples and fingerprints because new technology was coming about where they might be able to match these things to smudges left on one of the bottles that contain laced pills. Both of them maintain their innocence. Not a whole lot has come from it since then, but that's not exactly where his story ends. In 2010, James had an interview, and during this interview, he was asked to admit whether or not he was the killer, but he refused. He was asked about the letter, and he said, quote, I never dreamed it would have any type of impact on those, the victims. If I had, I never would have written it, end quote, which, I mean. How can you write something and then not expect it to have an effect? Yeah, like something that, like a letter like that is definitely going to impact the victims. It's going to raise alarm and make people scared, so... That kind of shows his disconnect with reality. Also in this interview, he promoted his new novel, which was titled Poison. And it's a weird sci-fi thriller kind of post-apocalyptic novel about (laughs) poisoning the water. And a lot of people thought this was really weird that a guy who was accused of poisoning a bunch of people would write a book like this. So that's kind of a bizarre (laughs) thing to do, I think. The FBI is still pretty convinced that Lewis is the killer, but they just haven't been able to find evidence to make that claim concrete. In 2004, James Lewis went back to prison, this time for rape and kidnapping, but he was released in 2007 after serving three years because the charges were dropped after the victim refused to testify. Lewis has a weird website, cyberlewis.com, which you can go and check out if you want, and it's pretty much just full of ramblings. There's some some parts of it are him trying to claim his innocence with the Chicago Tylenol murders. He talks about how he was in New York, not Chicago, and kind of some other weird rambly stuff. He also rails against Johnson & Johnson a lot and talks about Tylenol a lot and how it's dangerous, all this stuff about that. And he also tries to promote his book, Lewis is pretty convinced that artificial intelligence is going to take over the world. We kind of talked about that with Ted Kaczynski. Lewis is sort of similar in thinking that technology is our downfall. So he also talks about that a lot. But it's all pretty incoherent, in my opinion. It's all over the place. But if you want to check that out, it's still up. And since this case has so many different victims and suspects that were considered... There were a lot of theories that went along with it, and one of them that was really interesting was by Michelle Rosen, which is Mary Reiner's daughter. And Mary Reiner, if you remember, was the woman who died right after giving birth because she was taking medication for her labor pains. Michelle was eight years old when her mother died, and she really dug into this case as she got older. She believed that the FBI and the police departments were trying to cover up something about this case that they weren't telling the public. There was pressure on the FBI to close the case so that way records could be unsealed and everyone in the public could read them to learn more about what was going on with these Tylenol murders, but they wanted to keep this case open And she believes this was a way to help prevent the public from learning about any involvement with Johnson & Johnson or anything that may make the police look fishy. She also believed that the 2009 raid on the Lewis home that was supposed to be for the Chicago Tylenol murders was just a way to keep the case active. So that way some of the files could remain closed. Because after 25 years when a case is inactive, you can file a FOIA request and retrieve some of those files that were previously closed to the public. So with them reactivating the case, this would avoid that and they would be able to prolong it for another 25 years before people could get access to these files. She also claims that Johnson & Johnson only tested 1% of the bottles that they received in the recall and that they did this because they were being lazy, they didn't want certain information getting out, but they wanted it to seem like they were trying to figure out what was going on and they were really looking into it even though they weren't. But 1% of 31 million bottles is a lot of bottles. So that's a pretty good sample size for them to base their information off of so it seems like they were really trying to do their part so I don't really know how I feel about that one point yeah because they were going to destroy the bottles anyway so 
it's not like they were going to put this back out to the public. They were, you know, doing the tests that they felt necessary to get a reading on how many bottles were affected statistically, which in science is a pretty common way of doing it. Michelle Rosen also agrees with the man named Scott Bartz, who has some of his own theories. And he used to be an employee at Johnson & Johnson. He believes that it was an employee that committed this crime somewhere during their packaging process or the distribution process and that Johnson and Johnson is just covering it up to cover their butts basically. He even wrote a book called The Tylenol Mafia that talks about the corruption within Johnson and Johnson and the Tylenol industry. In his book he talks about how two cops found a case of Tylenol outside of a motel and then they ended up getting sick from breathing in the fumes but this was never really backed up that we saw. It was written about in Bart's book The Tylenol Mafia. He also believes that Mary Rayner, Michelle's mother, had gotten the Tylenol from the hospital that she gave birth in rather than from the store, which would kind of counteract what the police were saying happened with all of them coming from different grocery stores. But according to Mary Rayner's husband, she used the Tylenol that was purchased at the grocery store. He also thinks that Mary Rayner got the Tylenol from the hospital that she gave birth in rather than buying it from a grocery store. And this is significant because it kind of counteracts what the police were saying, if it were true, about it happening inside of a grocery store rather than it happening at the distribution level. But according to Mary Rayner's husband, she was using the Tylenol from a bottle purchased at the drugstore and not the one from the hospital. Bartz also claims that all of the contaminated bottles came from the same warehouse and that Johnson & Johnson fought to not have to recall their medication. I feel like a lot of these theories don't hold a lot of water. I think it's pretty obvious, like, when they say, oh, they all came from the same warehouse. Like, of course they did. Distributors work in regions, so all of the medicine in the region is obviously going to come from the warehouse. They don't pull, like, one shipment from a warehouse on this side of town and one from th on the other side of town. Like, certain regions pull from certain distributors. So that's not really a smoking gun of any kind. Also... Everyone became ill in such a short period of time that it seems like if it happened at the distributor level, it would be so much more up to chance because you couldn't really say whether the tampered bottle was going to be on the front of the shelf or the back of the shelf. Maybe it'd be an overstock in the back. You know, the, every single bottle was on the shelf and purchased and within a very short period of time, the people became ill. And what we heard before was that cyanide can degrade the gel capsule, so... We know they're not sitting there for months or even weeks. It had to happen pretty quick. So I think if it came from the distributor, it wouldn't have happened like that because from the distributor, they put a bunch in a box, the box shows up at the store, and then they put it on the shelf. Anyone who works in retail knows that it's just not, you know, it's just not how it works. You put a certain number on the shelf, the rest goes in overstock, and there's no way of knowing that every single one of those laced bottles would be on the front of the shelves. If it was at the distributor level, it seems like more bottles would have been tampered with because they would want the maximum effect. And knowing what I just said, where not all the bottles would make it to the shelf and some of them would be in the back of the shelf. So the deaths would be more spread out, in my opinion, and more people would have died because they would have tampered with more bottles. More bottles would have been found with cyanide. I just, to me, his theories don't really make any sense. So theories on this case ranged a lot. Some people thought that the murders were just sort of a broad scheme to cover up one targeted murder. Some people thought it was an attempt to show how fragile the U.S. economy was or to bring down Tylenol or Johnson & Johnson specifically. And other people thought it was just a completely random act of terror, just intending to make people fearful of these everyday products that people reach for without even thinking. In 1983, Congress passed the Tylenol bill which made it a federal offense to tamper with consumer products. And we've sort of seen that come up now recently with people, you know, licking ice cream and putting it back and things like that. Like, that's a federal crime now. And that's because of this case. In 1989, the FDA established guidelines for manufacturers to make products tamper-proof to try to prevent this from happening again. But even so, a lot of copycat cases sprang up after this. There were at least 270 incidents, with about 36 of them being counted as true tamperings. And these ranged from poisoned chocolate milk and orange juice to Sudafed and Excedrin and even other Tylenol tamperings from New York to Texas. As of 2009, Johnson & Johnson is offering a $100,000 reward 
for the murderer to be apprehended in the Tylenol murder case. But in the last 10 years, we've really heard nothing in terms of, you know, new evidence coming up or them being any closer to apprehending someone. And we thought that we'd leave you with this quote by Joan Ahern, who was a friend of Paula Prince, just to show you sort of the lasting effect that this crime had. And she said, quote, I swear to you, there were no over-the-counter pills in my house for over two years. No aspirin, no Tylenol. I lost my trust in humanity. I was afraid to give my kids milk because there were no safety caps on the milk. I was worried about cereal. I kept thinking to myself, if they can open up a pill bottle and put cyanide in there, what's stopping them from poisoning all of our food? End quote. You can see that the fear really lasted a long time in this community and for the people affected. Even people outside of the community where things started stretching farther across the country, everyone was scared. Yeah, and it really is like a very pointed act of terrorism because you're making people lose trust in things they don't even think about. You know, you just take it for granted. You have a headache, you take a Tylenol, and now people are second guessing every consumer product that they have. What seals are on it, what is preventing someone from tampering with it. And not to mention we rely on those kind of things because people can grow their own food and get their own milk from a farm and things like that and know that it's not poisoned, but who really does that? And then thinking about medication, it's very rare that someone knows how to make medicine. So we rely on buying it from the store. Yeah, you just take for granted that these pills are going to make you feel better and not worse. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to our episode about the Chicago Tylenol murders. Don't forget to subscribe and like us. Give us some feedback. We love to hear from you. Make sure you tune back in in two weeks to hear our, because it'll be a good one. So we'll catch you next time. Bye. Pajamas. You put on my pajamas. It sounds <laughs> sale. We say pajamas. We say pajamas in these parts. The an F the <laughs> So I was like, that does make sense, but okay, whatever. And the way they hand hand is it good out. I like the way I said it the first time. The pole, my double eyes start working together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at it. Don't make eye contact. Damn, don't come over there. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Did you come over here?